Now, um, you, I've probably told you more about this than ever you wanted to know, but uh, at least I hope there, there are no uncertainties left. Oh, sorry, yes. You've got me. I really don't know. Um, nor do I know where you, should, where you should look if you decide to write the whole of your research paper on that question. <laughs> Sorry, when, uh, when a professor doesn't know, the honest thing is to admit he doesn't know. I shouldn't think so, but I don't know. I don't know. May we move on? Where are we? Um... Puritan Church Life, Worship, Fellowship and Pastoral Care is the theme for today. And what you should have is one page outlining uh, the ground that we're going to try and cover with Pastoral Care, paragraph 3, as the longest of the paragraphs halfway down the page. And then on the back of that you should have an extract from the Directory for the Public Worship of God, an extract which, when you look at the heading, turns out to be on the preaching of the Word. And then after that, you should have some pages taken from the collected works of Richard Baxter, that's uh, written in at the top of the page. And if you look at the headings, you see that you have the Order of Celebrating the Sacrament of the Body and Blood of Christ, several pages of that the celebration of the sacrament of baptism and then of catechizing two pages from the end of catechizing and the approbation of those that are to be admitted to the Lord's Supper I don't think we shall get on to any of that today if we do I shall be delighted but um, realistically I don't think we shall however it needs to be there and please bring it along tomorrow um, if we start it today we shan't finish it today and it has to do with um, principles of Puritan worship which I do want to go to town on a little bit but now I pause just to ask has everybody got that material? right? Um, that was certainly what uh, Brian, the indefatigable, brought in today. Let's then start moving, if we may, through Puritan church life, worship, fellowship and pastoral care as these matters um, are listed for us on the outline sheet. Paragraph 1, worship. And 1a, biblical authority in worship. The Puritans insisted in a way which perhaps will be news to you that the worship of God in the congregation in fellowship that is with other believers is the prime activity for which we are saved in which throughout our Christian lives we are to exercise ourselves and which then we shall continue perfectly now to perform when we get to glory. Um, see on that, if you doubt it, said the Puritans, the fourth and fifth chapters of the book of Revelation, where a door is opened in heaven, and you see that worship is heaven's central activity. I've met many people who are surprised to find that worship, thus understood, um, was in truth central to the Puritan understanding of Christian discipleship. If you don't constantly exercise yourself in worship, they said, then your Christian life is distorted and you are living really misshapen in terms of your own discipleship. But now, having said that much, they went on to say, in Christian worship, as in every other Christian activity, 
Biblical principle must rule. And here, as I've told you in the part, uh, already, right from the start, um, they were a little out of step with the Reformation settlement of the Church of England because they appealed to Scripture as what they called the regulative principle and understood the principle as um, uh, declaring that nothing which is not prescribed or instanced in Scripture ought to enter into the public worship of God, or the private worship of God come to that. And the Anglican way of um, structuring the settlement had worked on the principle that uh, while biblical principle is to govern the arrangements the church makes for its own inner life at every point, in the application of those principles, it is proper to appeal both to history, or as to give it its theological name, tradition, that is, what the people of God have done down the centuries and found good, and it's proper also to appeal to reason to work out what applications of biblical principle are likely to be most edifying to worshippers in the present. And the Puritans under Elizabeth were not, I have to give, I have to show my hand here, not so wise. Uh, I hope that uh, straight away when I described the Anglican way of um, uh, the Anglican way of structuring church life that you saw the wisdom of it. How can appeal to ch tradition, that is the church of his church's history be wrong when the people of God down the centuries have worked with the same Bible with which we work and have been the inheritors of the same promise that the Spirit of God will be with the Lord's people to lead them into all truth. We, I know, are most of us uh, taught in our earliest days um, what in fact is a caricature, namely that everything in the church went wrong at the end of the apostolic age and nothing was right and nothing went right then until the time of the Reformation. That in fact is what the um, less well-educated Anabaptists of the 16th century actually thought and taught, but it was never part of the viewpoint of what the books describe as the Magisterial Reformation, uh, Luther and Calvin. Um, they were merciless when dealing with the errors and mistakes of the medieval period, but with it, they were merciless within the frame of confidence that in most matters, uh, most of the doctrines of the creeds, most of the insights in, that relate to Christian devotion, um, when those insights had been uh, articulated, the teaching of the Spirit of God, giving understanding of and teaching people to apply what was written in the Word, was a valuable resource. Uh, it's only in these latter days that uh, evangelicals have got into the habit of talking the way that the 16th century Anabaptists talked and saying, uh, in effect, that there's nothing worth looking at twice between the end of the Apostolic Age and the time of the Reformation. But the Elizabethan Puritans, some of them anyway, they were mostly young men, I hasten to say, um, men still in their twenties, men not as mature nor yet as wise as um, some, some others. Um, they, they were in the forefront of challenging the Anglican, uh, the established Anglican order and they 
often did so by uh, systematically rubbishing everything that had been the case in the church in the West until the Reformation began and then on the basis of um, that or, or, or using that rubbishing as a springboard shall I say they went on to say and now we want the Church of England to fall into line with what they regularly described as the best reformed churches by which they meant what we understand to go on in Geneva um, Calvin's Geneva being maintained in Calvin's order by his successor Theodore Beza and there are other reformed churches on the continent that have followed the Geneva pattern 100% and that's what they're trying to do up in Scotland also under John Knox well now uh, we want to see the same in England that was the um, campaigning line which these young Turks developed and um, they insisted that the right way to understand the regulative force of scripture in matters of worship was to stop short at saying if it isn't in the Bible in the form of either a command or an example of it being done well it ought not then to be part of the worship of the church in these days and I think I told you that they had uh, some warrant in my judgment for complaining particularly about four ceremonies that were prescribed in the prayer book as part of public worship but which they thought were superstitious and calculated to anchor the people of England in Roman Catholic error of the old pre-Reformation sort. Remember that? There was the surplice, the uh, white overall that the minister wears as um, his uniform when he's leading in worship. Um, it's not good to have surplices, said the Puritans. It encourages people to think that priests are holier than people. Um, presbyters, that is to say, are closer to God than those whom they lead in worship. And that isn't so. And they objected to the sign of the cross, which the minister was instructed to make on the forehead of the child when water had been poured on that forehead in, the in, in infant baptism. They said that sign shouldn't be made because superstitious people think that that's the essence of the sacrament. And it isn't the essence of the sacrament, is uh, the symbolic going under water when the water is poured over the candidate's head, uh, as I said. And then there's kneeling at the Lord's table, kneeling to receive Holy Communion. That's superstitious, they said. That implies that you believe still in transubstantiation, that Christ has come to be present in the bread and wine, and you're um, worshipping him as uh, locally present in those elements. All the best reformed churches, they said, sit uh, for the Lord's Supper and they pass the elements, the bread and the wine, from one to another. Well, that's what we ought to be doing in the Church of England, said these men. And the fourth ceremony was the use of the wedding ring in marriage. As with the sign of the cross in baptism, the Puritan complaint was that the ring was taken by ignorant people to be the outward and visible sign of uh, marriage understood as a sacrament the way that the pre-Reformation church had understood it. Marriage isn't a sacrament, they said, and we shouldn't encourage people in the belief that it is. So it's better not to exchange wedding rings. Well, one can see the weight of their point when they complain about these rights as uh, encouraging superstition but one can still say um, one can still conclude as frankly I do and as the majority of Anglicans and certainly all the, um, the Anglican hierarchy concluded in the Elizabethan era that the arguments uh, against these ceremonies are not so strong as to warrant abandoning them because 
in their own different ways, they do make for order and edification, and the Anglican apologists were prepared to spell out how that was so. My point is simply that this was a matter of constant debate um, during the Elizabethan era. The Puritans wanted the prayer book um, further reformed than it had been, and officialdom um, opposed them at that point. Note that the Puritans at that time had no problem with the idea of a prayer book. The idea that there's something unspiritual about set forms doesn't really take off in Puritanism or anywhere else until after the great ejection of 1662. Uh, you remember that one of the requirements which brought about the ejection was the requirement that uh, those who were going to continue as clergy in the Church of England should undertake to um, revere the prayer book as needing no further reformation. And what that did in the minds of some of those who couldn't regard the revised prayer book so highly they could all, I think, uh, to my knowledge, accept it as fit for use, but they couldn't regard it as um, not able to profit from yet further uh, adjustment of details. Um, but as I say, they, 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 uh, after they'd gone out, um, one detects a certain hardening in the hearts of some of them against the liturgical principle, as we may call it, the principle that is of having set forms as ingredients in uh, Christi corporate Christian worship. When you think about it, um, skepticism about the value of set forms for prayer is extraordinary when neither the Puritans nor anyone else has ever questioned the worthwhileness of having agreed forms of words for singing that is, um, psalms and then hymns. Yes, I, I know that um, every now and then my charismatic friends move into an exercise of uh, uh, humming their way up and down the notes of the, ar the, 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 the notes of an arpeggio, the arpeggio of the major chord. They call it singing in the spirit. And um, I'm not saying that that's... Uh, fruitless or useless for edification. But I am saying that I'm very glad that when it comes to psalm singing and hymn singing, we allow ourselves to agree on a form of words. We sing the psalms either in the Anglican prayer book way, where the translation is in, pro in prose, or in the Scottish metrical psalter fashion. There have been other metrical psalters produced since the Scot Scottish one of the um, of the late 16th century um, there, was a, there was another one already produced in the middle of the 17th century and on it's gone but there is agreement that this is how we're going to sing the Psalms and we have hymn books or as nowadays we have um, screens on which um, the words that we're going to sing together are projected well, it's much better to have words that we all sing together so that approximately the same flow of thought is going on through all our hearts than not to have agreed forms of words so that we all sing with something different in our hearts and making different vocal sounds into the bargain um, and uh, so produce what uh, Eeyore in Winnie the Pooh would have called a confused noise. So it seems to me, anyway, I, I share that opinion with you. Um, you must evaluate it as you think fit. But as I said, after the Great Ejection, a number of uh, significant Puritans began to write uh, against the principle of having any set form of words. John Owen does that in uh, the treatise in volume four of his collected works titled The Work of the Holy Spirit in Prayer. Um, he argues for the uh, gift of prayer um, in the man leading worship and against the restricting 
of that gift by obliging him to use a liturgy. Um, and he argues that the church is better off without any set form of words at all. Um, John Bunyan, the Baptist, uh, wrote a treatise on prayer where he pursues the same polemic as one of his applications. Certainly, ever since the 16th century, um, Puritans who accepted the principle of a prayer book had pleaded that they be allowed to pray extempore for the congregation and for the ministry of the word when they got into the pulpit and before they started to preach. But that had been something which they regarded as supplementary to the prayer book service, not an alternative to it. I'm talking now about um, the later development in Puritanism of um, whereby extempore prayer uh, uttered by someone who has a gift of extempore prayer is thought of as a complete alternative to having set forms of words. Well, that's how the Puritans dealt with the principle of biblical authority in worship. Um, all the specific matters expressed in prayer and praise must be biblically warranted and for, the, uh, for many of the Puritans anyway the regulative principle as I've described it has to be strictly applied. This raises the question which I, which I raise or note under B um, 1B appropriate direction in worship prayer book or directory. Um, at the time of the Westminster, Con the Westminster Confession and the um, attendant documents um, that's in the late 40s of the 17th century the prayer book had been proscribed not because of any high um, principle embraced by Parliament to the effect that um, liturgical worship was improper, but simply because the prayer book had been the rallying point of the anti-Puritan Laudians, that is the followers of Archbishop Laud, who had given the Puritans so hard a time during the late 1620s and 1630s. Um, so the prayer book, that, that particular prayer book, was uh, declared for a forbidden document for use in public worship um, in England after 16, now, now, from now on, and the, the now on was 1645 when this ordinance was passed. So the Westminster Directory for Public Worship had to assume that the church was getting on without um, a prayer book. And you, you find the Westminster Directory in this volume, the volume titled on its spine, Westminster Confession of Faith, but actually containing the Confession, the two uh, catechisms, the Directory for the Public Worship of God, and one or two other things beside, a Scottish document, for instance, um, on uh, saving knowledge, a catechetical sort of document, and uh, an appendix on the appropriate form of church government, which the Westminster divines did produce, but which um, in their day nobody took any notice of. Well, you can't have everything. Um, in this volume, however, you, you do find the Westminster Directory and you read it through and you realize, yes, they are being very careful not to say anything about set forms, so they don't speak of a prayer book. When they use the word directory, their thought is, um, these are the principles by which and the lines along which Worship is to be conducted by the person leading. 
um, assuming that he will pray extempore, um, the directory tells him what ground to cover. It's almost, you see, a liturgy, but not quite. He's to pray to this effect. And then comes the layout of topics, um, which in fact amounts to um, virtually a set form for prayer, though not quite. Well, that's what point B is all about. Um, there is a lot to be said, actually, for uh, combining the liturgy of, uh, a set f of, of a full-scale set form, a prayer book, and directory di type directions um, and leaving it to the minister um, to cover the set ground either by using the prayer book forms or by uh, praying extempore according to his own judgment of what's going to help the congregation most. And when Richard Baxter, I, I, I jump ahead here, I shall come back to this tomorrow, but when Richard Baxter um, challenged in 1661, went away for three weeks and wrote a complete, uh, a complete alternative to the um, revised prayer book, which the Puritans were being asked to comment on. He called it the Reformed Liturgy. Well, he followed the directory pattern. And everything uh, you'll find, which, um, er, 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 everything I mean, in which, which constitutes prayer, is, in, uh, is introduced by a form of words which says, then shall the minister pray in these words or along these lines. And Baxter deliberately um, leaves it open to the minister to decide what he's going to do. Well, that it seems to me was the best of both worlds, and I think it's a great pity that Baxter's reformed liturgy was never taken seriously hasn't been taken seriously yet in Western worship. Perhaps its day will come, after all, uh, 300 and, well, what is it now? Uh, three, nearly 350 years after, um, coming up to 400. We shall see. It's time, I think, for your break. Uh, I think that what I've been saying is fact, straightforward. Have you understood everything that I've been saying so far. No questions that you need to ask me about what I meant when I said something. Uh, broader questions we can save for a bit. Have a break. Ten minutes break, and then uh, we'll proceed.